In this video, I'll be going through the 2020 Level 1 Mechanics paper. Question 1. Felix Baumgartner is famous for jumping from a height of 40 kilometers above the Earth. He fell for over 240 seconds before opening his parachute. And with post-editing magic, here's the image here. Below is a graph of his speed versus time for the first 60 seconds of his jump. Describe Felix's motion in sections A and C of this graph. The graph we have here is a speed time graph. And as we can see in section A here, his speed is increasing at a steady rate from 0 to 300. That means we have constant acceleration. As for section C, we see that the speed does not change. Felix is falling at a constant speed of 350. State the maximum speed reached by Felix. Well, as I just wrote, we can see that he reaches a maximum speed of 350. Use the graph to calculate Felix's acceleration in the first 30 seconds. Our first 30 seconds are from here to here, where we can see that he has gone from a speed of 0 to 300 meters per second, which he has done in 30 seconds. The equation for acceleration that we're going to use is this one here. Our delta v is the change in velocity, which since he has gone from 0 to 300 is just 300. And our change in time is 30 seconds. And that gives us 10 meters per second per second. Use the graph to calculate how far Felix fell in the first 30 seconds. Now, as you hopefully recall, on a speed time graph, distance is the area underneath the line. And as we can see, we have a triangle, and the equation for the area of a triangle is half base times height, where our base is at 30 seconds and our height is 300 meters per second. And that gives me 4,500 meters. Our graph here is repeated from page 2. Draw and label the arrows on the diagram below to show the size and direction of the vertical forces acting on Felix in section A and section C of the graph. Now the image that should be there looks like this. So let me just draw in replacements. Perfect. Now the first force that we'll talk about is gravity. The size of the gravity force is dependent on mass. Since Felix's mass does not change, the force of gravity is going to be the same in both scenarios. Now in section A, we see that Felix is accelerating. He is accelerating because there is an unbalanced force downwards, meaning that our larger force is our downwards gravity. Because Felix is falling through an atmosphere, however, we're going to have some air resistance pushing upwards. Now in section C, we don't have any acceleration. The velocity, the speed, is constant. What that means is that the forces must be balanced, meaning that the size of the air resistance is the same size as gravity. They are equal and they are opposite. Explain the motion in section A and section C by comparing the vertical forces acting on Felix. And so, as I was saying, we have the gravity force, which does not change because the mass of Felix does not change. And then we have our opposing force of air resistance. Initially, air resistance is smaller than gravity, meaning that there is an unbalanced downwards force, which is accelerating Felix downwards. But then as he accelerates, his speed increases. So too does his air resistance to the point where it is equal to that of gravity. At this point, since the forces up and down are equal, there is no more net force, and there is therefore no more acceleration. Felix will travel at a constant velocity. 
as we see on the graph. So let me phrase that. The downwards gravity force does not change as Felix's mass is constant. The upwards force of air resistance is initially smaller than the gravity force, leaving an unbalanced downwards net force that accelerates him. As Felix's speed increases, so too does the force of air resistance. At a point called terminal velocity, the air resistance force equals the gravity force, and the net force is zero. This means Felix does not accelerate, and instead travels at a constant speed. Question 2. Each year, firefighters run up the sky tower. Lindley is preparing for this event by running up the stairs in her building. Each day, she climbs to a height of 25 meters. Below is data from two of these days. And we see where, given the mass of Lindley and her equipment, which does not change, we see that the height of the stairs does not change, but that on day one, she completes it in 50 seconds, and on day two, she reduces that to 30 seconds. Compare the work done and power produced by Lindley on each of these days. In your answer, you should calculate the work done on each day and calculate the power used on each day. Now at the start of our exam, we're given a list of formulas. We're interested in the work done, which is our force times distance, but actually we'll use this equation here, which is the gravitational potential energy equation, but does actually the same job. Our mg is our force, and our delta h is our distance, and our energy is just another word for work. So it's actually the same thing. For our power, we're going to need to use this equation here. So to calculate our work done, we're going to use our gravitational potential energy equation, which is mg delta h, where the mass is 80, our gravitational acceleration is 10, and our change in height is 25. And that gives me 20,000 joules. Remembering that joules is the unit of energy. Now, since between the two days, the mass is the same and also the height is the same, the only thing you might recall that changes is our time, the work done on day two is also going to be 20,000 joules. Our equation for power is work over time, where our work is 20,000, and our time on the first day is 50 seconds. We're on the second day, it's 30, and that gives us 400, the units of power are watts, and here we get 6.66666, which will round up to 667. Now let's summarize our findings. The work on both days is the same as her mass and stairway height does not change. Her power is greater on the second day as she climbs quicker. Lindley looks into the stairwell and her helmet falls off. The helmet falls between the stairs without touching them. She estimates that the helmet would hit the ground at 20 meters per second. Using conservation of energy and assuming no external factors, calculate the height from which the helmet fell. The mass of the helmet is 1.5 kilograms. In your answer, you should calculate the kinetic energy of the helmet just before it hits the ground and describe from which form this kinetic energy has transformed. So we know the final velocity is 20 meters per second, and we know the mass of the helmet is 1.5 kilograms. We know the acceleration due to gravity, and we're trying to find the height. To find the height, we can use the equation for gravitational potential energy on your formula sheet. We can rearrange this equation by dividing both sides by mass and gravity. Now we know the mass, we know the gravity, but we don't know the gravitational potential energy. But what we do know is that there are no external factors and we can use conservation of energy and as it wants us to do, consider the energy transformations. So what we know is that as our helmet falls, at the top we're going to have our gravitational potential energy. By the time the helmet gets to the bottom, however, all of that gravitational potential energy is going to be transferred to the kinetic energy. 
assuming that there are no other external factors, such as air resistance. What that means is that our kinetic energy is equal to our gravitational potential energy. Which means our EG, our gravitational potential energy, is equal to the kinetic energy, and our formula for kinetic energy, which we're given, is half mv squared, where we know the mass, that's our 1.5, and we know our velocity of 20. And that gives us 300 joules. So now putting that number in over here, as well as our others, and that gives us 20 meters. So we've calculated our height as the question wants, and we've calculated the kinetic energy as it said we should. Now we also need to do this second point here, describe from which form this kinetic energy has transformed. The form in question is gravitational potential energy. The kinetic energy has transformed from gravitational potential energy. Explain why the helmet will not reach a speed of 20 meters per second. The reason for this is air resistance. To perform the previous question, we had to assume that there was none, but in reality, there will be some air resistance that will slow down the helmet. As the helmet falls, it will experience a force of air resistance opposing its motion. This causes a portion of the kinetic energy to be lost as heat. The kinetic energy at the bottom will therefore be less, and so too will its speed. Question 3. NASA has revealed a possible vehicle to travel over the Martian surface. Mars is a very dusty planet with much lower gravity than ours. The gravity on Mars is 3.7 newtons per kg. On Earth, it is 10 newtons per kg. Define mass and weight. Definitions that, if you're sitting this exam, you should already know. Mass is a measure of the amount of matter making up something. Weight is the gravitational force on an object. Explain what 10 newtons per kg means. And so to clear up any confusion, 10 newtons per kg is the same thing as 10 meters per second per second. These are two different ways of writing acceleration. Now, when we write this out as 10 newtons per kg, this is a direct statement that an object on Earth will experience 10 newtons of force per every kilogram of its mass. So let's write that. An object on Earth will experience 10 newtons of gravitational force for every kilogram of its mass. Calculate the weight force of the Mars vehicle when it is on Earth and when it is on Mars. The mass of the Mars vehicle is 2,500 kilograms. Now, as it's asking for weight, we are going to use this equation here, where our weight is our force of gravity, our mass is our 2,500 kilograms, and our acceleration is the acceleration due to gravity, which is our 10 on Earth and our 3.7 on Mars. And that gives us 25,000 newtons. And on Mars, 9,250. There are six wheels on this vehicle with a surface area of 0.25 meters square per wheel. Calculate the total pressure that this vehicle would exert on Earth. Now if we scroll right up, we'll see that the equation for pressure that we talked about earlier is this one here, force divided by area. Now the force is the force of gravity from our rover, which on Earth is 25,000 newtons. Now note that the question has asked us for the total pressure, not the pressure per wheel, which means we need to use this area here, but multiply it by six because we have six wheels. So that gives me 16,666.6666, so on, which I'll round up to 16,700. And our units of pressure are pascals. The Mars vehicle was placed on similar soils on Earth and on Mars. Explain why the Mars vehicle will sink to different depths on each planet. You should support your answer with a calculation. So first of all, from our previous question, 
We know that on Earth, the Mars vehicle exerts a pressure of 16,700 pascals. Now, since we're clued in that we need to make a calculation, the calculation we need to make for comparison is the pressure on Mars. The force on Mars was 9,250. And our area is the same, which gives me 6166.66666, which I'll round up to 6170, which tells us that as the gravitational force on Mars is less and the area is the same, there is less pressure on the soil. This means the rover will sink less on Mars. And that's it.